guys. Welcome back to the Modern Merchant Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie McCarthy, head of strategic accounts at FlexPoint. And today we have Rachel Go on with us. Um, Rachel, she works with a ton of B2B e-commerce companies to help build out scalable content engines. She's been a fractional marketing director for a few companies in the past, has worked with some really, uh, you know, sort of big names in our industry here. So super excited to, to have you on today, Rachel. How's it going? Thank you. It's going pretty well. How are you? Good, good. So I know we were just talking and, um, you know, Rachel, you do a little bit of our, our content for, you know, us here at FlexPoint, but can you just let everyone know, you know, who have you worked with, sort of what's your background um, in the e-commerce space, specifically around marketing? Because um, it was super interesting when you were talking to me earlier about that. I just didn't have a chance to write it all down. <laughs> No worries. So I got my start in marketing overall at a winery, um, moved on to Hubstaff. So they are a time tracking tool. And that's where I learned more about productivity and remote work and all the stuff that goes into building a content engine. So I was early growth with them. And then I got my first step into e-commerce with Skiwana. So I Thanks. started out doing all of their content, built out their calendar. We went from a, you know, zero posting schedule. It's just whenever anyone had time, they would write something and we'd post it to something like a five month runway of three blog posts a week. Wow. And that was alongside building out our guest post program. So we would do guest post exchanges with other industry players. And from there I met um, who would become my next big client in e-commerce and who really showed me like the back end of e-commerce and like the nitty gritty and how it all works. And that is Deliver. So I worked with Deliver yeah. for a really long time. Well, in the startup world, a really long time, but <laughs> I was their first marketing hire. I did, uh, so I did essentially content for them, which includes the blog, um, all of the repurposing. I ran their video program. I did their newsletter. I did webinars and partnerships. For a while I handled things like social, I, I mean, I have a list of this somewhere, but yeah. it's probably like, I don't even remember like all the stuff I did for a little while. I was assigning out leads for the sales team. It was like too much. It's the, it's the startup. It's the startup life. Yeah. You know? It's the, you wear any hat that you have to, to get the job done. Yeah. Whatever <laughs> was needed in acquisition is like, okay, I'll, I'll yeah. build out, you know, automated HubSpot uh, email stuff and all of that. I love that. When you talked about earlier, so Skubana, right? You built out sort of a, like a five month content calendar almost. How long did that take you to put together? I would say we got to a good spot within three months, just okay. because at that time there, they were a, already a known name. And so there were people who, for example, were integration partners who are just a no brainer to do blog swaps with. There were people right. who reached out to us who I could just respond to. And there were people who, when I reached out, they already knew the name. And so it was really easy to get a foot, you know, your foot in the door and get a, an exchange going. And all I had to do from there was read, you know, learn about our, our blog and what we could do and our product and learn and take a quick glance at the blogs of our target partners and figure out what yeah. they needed and the intersection between what we offered and something adjacent to what they offered and pitch those titles and get them basically written. So I actually managed a team of, I wanna say three to four freelancers to mm -hmm. handle all of that. So we were working on our own internal content as well as editing and publishing the guest posts that were coming in, as well as writing and editing the guest posts that were going out and then monitoring when they would get published. That's so, that. impressive. That's a ton of content in a really small window. <laughs> I don't have I, to tell you that. I, but. <laughs> well, I think, um, honestly, I have to give credit to our freelancers. I think in every client that I've worked with, the freelance team has always been a really big asset. And so I have, I still work with freelancers that I met from clients years and years ago. I think my, one of my oldest relationships with a freelancer is something like seven years or something wow. like that. So essentially with every client, I'll, I'll recruit a freelancer if I have to, or multiple freelancers. And then the ones that we have really, I have really good cadence with kind of, I can edit really well and they understand like my outlines and all of that. I'll, I'll, pull them along. I'll be like, Hey, I have yeah. a new client starting. Do you want, you know, some projects from this other business? Uh, and this is what they do. Here's an intro to them and things like that. Right. So I mean, right now, as you mentioned, I'm working with FlexPoint, my FBA prep, I work with Shogun a little bit. And for a lot of those articles, I still do 
you know, have boots on the ground and write them myself and write out the outlines. But for the ones that are like too much, because you really can't write a blog post a day and have it really good quality. I do, I do rely on those really long um, relationships and the, the freelancers that I worked with for so long that we pretty much understand without having to write, um, like I, I'll just leave one small comment in a Google doc and they'll be like, yep, got it. Yeah. So. And you don't have to like over explain it. It's, you know, mm-hmm. not overly and complicated. Honestly, for the freelancers that I've worked with for a really long time, their knowledge is similar to mine because even if they haven't worked directly with, for example, the UI of some of my, some of my clients, uh, products and things like that, yeah. they have written, out my ideas and my thoughts and my learnings around that product and the software. And so they know, oh, okay, this is the benefit of, for example, distributing inventory across your warehouse network. This is the benefit of bundling and kidding. This is the the challenges of bundling and kidding and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's incredible. The power of like having a really good network, I feel like is, is still pretty underrated. So, um, and so, you know, knowing that you have just such a, an impressive background, especially in kind of the SaaS and e-commerce world, that's really why, you know, I, I wanted to bring you on because I know, I mean, you've done like amazing work for us. I know you've worked with like the Scubanas and the Delivers of the world. Um, and so really, you know, t- talking today about marketing specifically for e-commerce and what all is involved in that. Um, and, you know, I think a really good place to start and, you know, whether you're a brand new you know, e-commerce business fresh on the scene, or if you've been, you know, active in selling for 15 years now, I think it's always super important, obviously, to uh, consistently revisit your marketing strategy. And so that's something I wanted to ask you, you know, when you are meeting with clients and you're taking them on, you know, what are the big questions any brand or e-commerce company should be asking when they're approaching their e-commerce marketing strategy? I would say before doing anything, whether you're reevaluating an existing strategy that is maybe not working or you want to improve your strategy or you're just getting started from scratch, I would say ask yourself how well you know your audience, because there are a lot of companies, especially um, product focused companies who the things they want to teach people are not the things people want to learn. And so the things that for example, you might want to create might be blog posts about how cool this feature is. But the things that your audience might want to actually consume might be a video about how to how to do, like, for example, instead of like a blog post on or an ebook on how to set up routing or things like that, your audience might just want a quick video on how to make your shipping fees cheaper, how to make it more affordable. Yeah. So I think you can spend a lot of time and money creating like ebooks um, and like all of these long form original research documents, white papers, things like that. But what does your audience consume? What does your audience actually want to know? Um, and there are a few ways you can uncover these things. So I would say you can look inward. So this is your customer research, your existing buyers, which you can learn about through your customer facing teams and other tools. And there's audience research, which is everyone in your audience that you want to reach, not just your customer. Um, and then if you wanted to go a little bit deeper into that, I have a little bit more notes on that, but, um, yeah, no, I'd love to let's dive into okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So for audience research, you have tools like industry reports, surveys, trend reports. Um, there are services that can kind of go out and do focus groups on your behalf and run reports on your behalf. So they can, they can report what's going on within the industry, within your, your target audience, what they care about, what's the state. It's the, like the state of e-commerce, state of B2B, like th- those kind of reports. Yeah. And then for your customer research, there's really nothing more valuable than hearing it from your customers themselves. So you want to talk to not just your best customers, but also your like meh customers, your, yeah. and even your, your churned customers and your worst customers, because there's value in knowing why they're not a good fit, right? Because you, you don't want more customers who sign up and purchase and, you know, take up your customer support team time, sending in returns and be like, hey, I hate this on social media, that kind of thing. So you might tap into interviews with your customers. So these aren't just case study interviews where you're talking about all the great stuff. They're actually um, interviews that uncover why they found you, what was their issue, like what triggered their search and what led them to you, who else were they considering alongside you? So who are your competitors? Who are your alternatives? They might not even be a competitor. It might just be in action, you know, and like instead of buying um, magnetic eyelashes, maybe the alternative is like 
like it's not mascara or it's not eyelash extensions maybe it's just like no makeup at all you know right this kind of thing so you can also tap into surveys and so these are things where you might pop out to your loyalty program um loyalty program members your newsletter uh, subscribers, people who have purchased from you, uh, people who have even churned, you can you can send surveys out to people who have direct contact with your brand and have purchased from you before and ask like those kind of things. And it's a little yeah. bit less insightful, I would say, than actually speaking to someone one on one. But it's also a good way to do it at scale because you can kind right. of aggregate those insights and turn them into more qualitative data. So if you happen to see one particular competitor's name come up a lot, that's a good data point. If you happen to see one complaint come up a lot or a similar family of complaints come up a lot, that's that's a good data point. Um, and then casual chats are just like, you know, having one on or like having uh, events or like mixers. Some companies have their own communities. Like I know a running shoe brand that puts on events. And so going yeah. to those and talking with your customers, all of that is really, really valuable. Um, and just consider every any chance you have to interact with your audience or your customers. It's an opportunity. So you want to ask whenever you can. Um, when someone signs up for a newsletter, ask them like, hey, what are you looking to learn from us? Or what brings you here? When someone signs up for your product or makes a purchase, you can ask something similar, like how did you find your buying experience? How did you find your checkout experience? How did, you know, how, how uh, did you find us as a brand overall? Right. Um, and then you can do that with um even if you can't talk directly to your customers you can still observe them so you can observe how they interact with your customer support how they interact with your sales team that'll uncover what their big questions are what they're what they care about learning what their concerns are um, you can look at the q a's that come in through your live webinars those i found some really good blog topics uh video topics webinar topics from q a's and webinars so yeah. i really recommend that um, and then learn like, why do they leave? Why do they, why do they purchase? Um, what do they want specifically from you? Why, what are they trying to achieve with your brand? So that's like a concept called jobs to be done. Um, yeah. What are they, what's their end state and how do you help them achieve it? Cause it's, it's the world is really shifting from, and the world of marketing content is really shifting from being more business and brand focused to being more customer focused instead of talking and that's that's the foundation of all good content, right? Instead of talking right. at people and saying whatever you want to say, you learn about what they want to hear, what they want to learn about, and you provide that and where they want to go and you help them get there. Yeah. No, I, I think that you hit the nail on the head too. And you said, you know, kind of speaking to them like in their in their own language, right? Like don't tell them what you think they want to hear, you know, give them content that they want to consume. And I think that's kind of within that same vein, right? Being more customer focused, understanding that like, yeah, I have this problem that I can solve for you, but like communicating that more in a way where it, it resonates with them, I think is huge. Um, and so I think too, especially with you're talking about interacting with customers and just getting valuable feedback, whether it's good or bad, right? That's the only way that you can really grow. Um, and I think it's huge on social media, right? Like I'm on Instagram on, you know, a, a brand's web or a brand's Instagram page and, you know, half of the comments in most of the posts are people saying like, hey, I needed to like return something or, you know, unfortunately, like maybe complaining about a certain product or like I got this from my daughter and I absolutely love it. So there's like a ton of just even like untapped, I guess, you know, data there even, right? Getting that feedback from customers on social media posts even. So um, that's super yeah. valuable. <laughs> Speaking about social media, one point that I also want that you reminded me of is to know your weaknesses as well. So social yeah. media is actually a weakness of mine. <laughs> I feel like I'm too old for it. Yeah. And so <laughs> when when you're a brand, um, you should also look at what your strengths and weaknesses are realistically. So instead of trying to do everything, figuring out where your what channels your customers are on and what you're actually good at because you know if your customers are really active on a particular social media channel and you just don't handle it because you don't like it because you're not you know very good at it and you say oh we're not getting results from it that might be that's a brand problem right that's not right. an audience thing it's yeah yeah a hundred percent and it is it's it's kind of that you know um 
it, it just allows you to really make those tweaks that are necessary, mm-hmm. right? That you may you know, just have not been aware of and you can kind of adjust and pivot, right? So all good feedback. I think, I don't think any feedback is technically bad feedback. I think if you're a brand and you're looking to grow and improve, you know, absorb it, right? Oh yeah. And so in that, or on that note, I know you mentioned, you know, there are a lot of different, you know, resources with the surveys with some of the companies who will also assist in kind of gathering data for you. But what do you think, like what key metrics do you think brands should really be paying attention to, to really help them kind of define and determine success or failure with a particular like marketing strategy? Okay. So if we are talking about content in particular, attribution can be a challenge because different tools track leads different ways. Different companies have different lead qualification signals. So like what you might consider a qualified lead or a kind of warm, warm lead might not be the same as a different brand. So I would say what I've done in the past is you can build out ways to qualitatively track results. For example, if you have like a sign up page or a self onboarding page, you can make an optional question about like, how did you hear us? You want to look at all of your attention metrics actually in particular in every industry, but in e-commerce in particular, and I guess SaaS as well, uh, retention and customer lifetime value can really make or break your business. So you want to look at yeah. How successful is your rewards program? How successful is your loyalty and referral program? How many times do people come back and repurchase? If you can track that. Um, and you want to also actually look at talking about acquisition, um, average order values, because mm-hmm. those are a good way to make use of your full acquisition spend, right? Yeah. So these are th- something that works really well with both CLV and AOV is subscription programs. How successful are, how many subscriptions can you sell? Because those people come back over a long period of time. Not only that, their overall spend with you is going to be higher. So even if you spend a little bit more to acquire a subscription customer, it'll yeah. even out and even benefit you in the long run because they eventually end up spending more. And then beyond that, they think of you more quickly. They're your more top of mind when they consider repurchasing. They don't even have to think about your competitors. Like if they're like, oh, I need to get a new you know, dose of vitamins. They're not like, oh, I'm going to go browse the stores for it. It's going to be like, oh, my next delivery is set. So don't have to worry about it. And that makes a good um, customer experience as well. Right. Um, One last thing that they have to even think about. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, this is kind of veered off of content, but the way you yeah. can, you might want to track this is, for example, um, like I mentioned, you can chat with your customers frequently. And if you have a subscription customer who is part of your loyalty program, who has shopped with you for a long time, um, if you chat with them, figure out how they found you. Um, there are tools that can track this um, depending on how well you integrate everything, like your CRM, um, and your, you know, your, your, met, your tracking and all of that. So like if you use, for example, I use Heap and Google Analytics, now mm-hmm. Google Analytics 4, um, you can actually see if you connect it with your customer manager, customer relationship manager, because you have yeah. to be able to track like the, the unique IDs of your customers through everything. So you can use tools like Google Analytics, um, now Google Analytics 4 and Heap and even like, like HubSpot, um, Copper, all of these other tools, if you integrate them so that they can track how people find you and then eventually yeah. how they interact with you, you can track how well your content does at acquiring customers, how well your content does at acquiring good customers who will stay for a long time and who don't churn, um, and how well or how poorly um, your content does with different segments of your audience. So you might separate your audience by small businesses, enterprise businesses, um, et cetera. This is getting more into the B2B, but for like, for example, e-commerce companies, you might segment them into like male and female for if if you're a clothing company or like by age groups, if you have certain lines that appeal to different ages um, or things like that. So you can see which content needs to be bumped up, which needs to be, you know, doubled down on, which can be improved and repurposed, which works right. well for yeah other things and all of that. Yeah. Super important to look at, I think. Um, and again, going back to that, right, for both new brands that are just emerging onto the scene and then also you know, these guys who 
have been around for a while because we know everything kind of comes in, in waves, right? And, you know, customer behavior last year is a little bit different than it is this year even. So just consistently monitoring that, I think, and, and just keeping an eye on that is, is huge. Um, mm-hmm. And then I know, you know, because you mentioned earlier, right? You can't write a blog post a day for six months straight, right? Like just mm-hmm. creatively, mentally, like the bandwidth that it takes for that, it's, you know, it's just not doable, right? So uh, that's actually one of my questions that I had for you, just sort of switching gears a little bit, Rachel, is, um, you know, how do you deal with like the burnouts or the creative blocks, right? You have all of these metrics and now you see, okay, maybe we need to, um, you know, change direction as far as the content we're creating, but you just have nothing that's coming to you, right? Do you have any kind of like strategy to sort of help you with that? That is such a good question. And I think it's something that really resonates with anyone who has to handle any sort of regular content output. Yeah. Um, And it's it's just all about ideas, right? So I'll answer this question in two parts. One is going to be how to kind of unstick yourself, as as, uh, you mentioned. And then the (laughs) other part is going to be how to deal with burnout. So if you run into a creative block, I think it's important to remember you have resources. Content should never work in a silo. So if you are all of a sudden stuck and you don't know what to write about next, you don't know what your customer cares about, it's really important to go back to your customer-facing teams, to your customers themselves, to your audience, and figure out what's going on, um, what's happening in their world today, um, what, what are their concerns what's the latest news um is there a new way or is there like a new trend or has there been a shift yeah has there been a shift in how your audience perceives you or how they use your tool that kind of thing so it's really important to build those content feedback loops with your sales team your support team to always get that like that flow whoever talks to your customers they're going to have insights right about what your customers care about so to build that flow and that open dialogue of like hey a lot of people have been asking about this lately. Can you create a video about it? Can you create a podcast on it? Can you host a webinar on it? Talking to your partners who reach out and say like, hey, some of our customers have been asking specifically about something that your solution or your brand covers. Do you want to partner on an event or a webinar or a conference? That kind of thing. So understanding that content marketing is an ecosystem. It shouldn't work in a silo. Um, It shouldn't work by itself. It should work with external partners, internal partners, um, your own customers and all of that. And then a really good tip for, you know, getting over just any blocks is figuring out how to repurpose your content. So you should be repurposing content anyway, um, especially for content that has taken a lot of resources to create, like you did a lot of research, you really put your time into it, it's insightful um, and unique, it's something that your you know, leadership team has contributed quotes and their own insights to, like that kind of thing. You should be repurposing content anyway, but if you're stuck in a rut, you can go back and look at what content performs really well and the metrics you wanna look at there, the ones that I've looked at before are what has gotten us uh, qualified leads. And so again, right. this is measured in different ways, but what has gotten us a contact a submission, what has gotten us a merchant who has purchased, what has gotten us a merch as, as some examples, what has gotten us a merchant who has signed up for a subscription program. Mm-hmm. Look at the content that does that and repurpose it. So if it's a blog, turn it into a video and then put that on YouTube, put that video natively on your social profiles, relink the YouTube video into your blog. So when people read the blog next, there's a little bit of interactivity and some engagement that they can stop and watch. And actually I've, I've watched session replays um, with tools like Full Story, which is a tool that tracks customers as they navigate around your website. Um, <laughs> but it can see how people interact with your website. And I did notice that videos for our particular audience for that client got watched when people went to our solutions pages, people would stop and watch the video. So it got our bounce rate down. It kept people on the website a little bit longer and Mm -hmm. it answers their questions in ways that they prefer. So these, this, um, these viewers prefer watching a video because they would watch it to almost the end instead of scrolling down and skimming through our web content or our copy. So figuring out how to repurpose content, helps to ensure and especially well-performing content helps to ensure you're always giving your customers 
both interaction as well as value. So what they want to see. That's such great advice. The second point. Yeah, I was like, I feel like you have more. (laughs) The second point is near and dear to my heart because I have personally dealt with burnout um, more than once. I think I'm fortunate enough to say that all of my clients have been really excellent clients. I love learning about every single one, their business, their products, their audience. But sometimes the work is just so much, you know? And so what I've learned after more than 10 years of probably taking on too much is, well, one, you have to remind yourself that content isn't healthcare. You know, what's going to happen if you don't get a newsletter out on time? No one's going to die. You just send it out the next day. So it's resetting those expectations because I remember, especially when I first started in content, if something went wrong, it felt like the end of the world. It felt like, you know, you would be showering and you just remember, oh, I I left a typo in that newsletter. You just want to like lie down and curl up. Uh. And it's resetting that, you know, I mean, lives aren't writing on it. It's important, but it's, it's not your life and it's not other people's lives. So that's always a good reminder, especially for someone in content. Um, And then the other couple of tips I have is context switching can be your friend or your enemy. So if it lowers the quality of your work, and it's something you have to determine for yourself, right? If it lowers the quality of your your work, you need to learn how to avoid context switching um, too much. But for example, in school, I remember if things were really busy, the way I would take a break from my projects is by working on easier projects or like other projects. And so sometimes it actually helps you kind of re recenter or refocus a little bit. Yeah. So I, I would say context switching, if you know how to use it well, can help you with your productivity. Because if you're just stuck and you're not moving forward, you're not making progress, instead of being frustrated about that, you can move on to something else and wrap that up, get the quick endorphin rush from finishing that to-do list, and then move back to your original task. Um, especially if, you know, you don't have any time to, to waste and you're on a deadline, you yeah. move back to your original task and like, okay, I've accomplished something for today. I can, I can definitely get this done um, and kind of re, re coming back to that. Um, and then a, another thing is making sure you have enough help. So especially for startups, and I suspect for smaller teams, the content person is one person, but they're the entire marketing department. And you need to realize that that's not really sustainable. So you need to also know how to outsource, how to hire, how to get help, how to reach out and say, hey, this is too much for me, or this deadline isn't going to work. I have these 20 other things um, that are actually more important. So and learning how to do that and say no and push back and hire get get help and support where you need it is really vital. And then the last tip I have, which should be something that everyone knows, but I'll just state it again. You need to know when to take a break. You need to know when to log off and how to, because I think there isn't, there isn't a good way to say like, oh, you know, at 5 p.m. it's time to log off and separate your your work and your life, that's never worked for me. I'm working right. all all the time, but I know when it's time to stop. So I'm not gonna say like, you know, at 5 p.m. it's time to log off, or I'm not gonna say have one computer for work, one computer for personal, or like in, uninstall Slack from your phone, anything like that, because I don't practice it. So it would be <laughs> critical for me to, to suggest that. But knowing when it's time to, to log off or when it's time to take a vacation is a skill. It's a skill that not everyone has, and I took a while to cultivate it. And when I didn't have that skill, I dealt with burnout, and it affected work, and it affected quality of work, and even like my level of communication, how well I was able to convey status updates, project updates, things right. like that. So knowing when to stop and step back is really, it's important. And it's an underrated skill that people need to actually, a lot of people need to actually learn, so. Agreed. And honestly, Rachel, I think like everything that you listed there, it's just like good, just life advice in general, right? You know, nothing's really like life or death. I mean, to an extent, Mm -hmm. right? Let's take time to take a break. It's okay to, you know, switch from, you know, A to B when needed, Mm -hmm. right? Pivoting's okay. Um, but yeah, especially I think in, in the content world, and I think there is, you know, sort of that perception that you have to constantly be on 
And there's mm. just so much pressure to just always just be throwing content out. It's like at the end of the day, if it's not valuable, like you might as yeah. well not put anything out at all, right? Don't, so. don't waste your time. Don't waste your stress. That's bad for your health. Like putting things back into perspective is probably the biggest thing that you can, one of the biggest things that you can do to help you actually disconnect. Yeah. That's amazing advice. I really love that. And then, so last question I have for you, I know we're kind of coming up on time here, but you and I had talked about this previously, um, you know, especially with you know, what you do, you're working with multiple clients at a time, you know, four, you know, give or take at a time. Um, you know, what are your must have tools to develop content, to stay organized, right? With that content, that's obviously a big piece of this. Um, and to just really, you know, ensure that you're, you're working as efficiently as you can, as creatively as you can. Do you have any, you know, kind of go-to tools for that? The tools I use today, every day, are collaboration tools and measurement tools because I've moved okay. into a manager role. So these are Asana, Trello, Slack, Loom, and Vidyard if I need to give kind of more visual feedback to to team members, uh, mm -hmm. Google Docs, that whole that whole suite of Google, I love um, Google Analytics. And as a quick tip, you want to switch over to GA4 now because Universal Analytics is going away. Um, Heap and Full Story. So these are the things that I use to collaborate and to track how well the content, our content, and our marketing efforts are doing. But back when I was creating content and really focused on on kind of boots on the ground writing things, you need ideation tools, you need research tools, SEO tools, editing and proofing tools. And if I switch my hat to, you know, learning more about my customers, I need interviewing tools, I need surveying tools. Um, and then if we switch roles to, you know, instead of a blog, working on other types of content, such as video, webinars, uh, audio, things like that, you need webinar software, you need, Same podcast tools, you, you need like, you know, the, the, the editing tools and all of that. So there are a lot, there's so many different useful tools in content. And I have a blog post that I can share as a resource after that has more than 200 of the tools that I've come across. I haven't tested all of them, but every time I see an interesting one and I'll, I'll check out their website to make sure it's not just like, you know, snake oil, but I'll add it to that. But though I've, I've used so many tools like over the course of being a subject matter expert to being a project manager, to being a content strategist, to being a marketing director, that it's it's so hard to list all my favorites. Um, those are just the ones that I use today. Yeah, that'd be awesome. If you can, we'll be sure to include that in the, the episode show notes too, if anyone wants to check that out. So yeah, can so, you tell me a little bit more then, Rachel, about GA4? Sure. So when I mentioned that Google Ana Analytics 4 is replacing UA, what I, what I was referring to is Google Analytics its current version, which many, many content marketers have relied on to see page views and sessions and bounce rate and all of that, is actually changing. And it's changing quite drastically. And by June or July, I believe, of 2023, all of your historic data from, universal, from the existing current state of Google Analytics, it's going away. And so as soon wow. as possible, what you want to do is set up your Google Analytics 4 account, which is a new version of Google Analytics. It's new and approved, and it's much more focused on events than cookies. The instigator for this is the world is shifting from focusing on cookies to focusing more on privacy. And so to combat this, Google Analytics has shifted from relying more on cookies, which are honestly more unreliable now because people can block those, people can kind of, you know, uh, uh, they can avoid them, they can turn on VPNs, they can opt out. Yes. So the way, the way that GA4 works is still really like, it's so different. As uh, Jill Quick of col the coloring in department puts it, Google Analytics 3, which is UA, which is the current version that we're used to, is mm -hmm. like a car. Google Analytics 4 is a helicopter. And so it's so vastly different wow. that you can't even think of it really the same way um, because the attribution model is different. The, the way that they track data and sessions is different. And the way, the, the way that dashboards are set up are different. And so that actually reminds me of something that is a good reminder for everyone in the content world, and that is to focus less on cookies and third-party tracking and more on customer-first data. And so this is first and second-party 
first and second party data. So these are the things that I mentioned earlier, which is the things that you hear yeah. directly from your customers, the things that you can see directly on your website. So for example, that session replay tool mm -hmm. um, or your loyalty program or your newsletter or the actual feedback that customers send you in your feedback forms. So it's really important to focus more on those than third party tracking because the more we progress into the new privacy focused world, the less reliable third party tracking is going to be. So you right. don't want to base your strategy on it. It's going to be wrong. Got you it. You might like, I mean, eventually you're going to end up just knowing what people who are not tech savvy do, right? Because they don't know how to opt out of third party cookies. Right. So you just all click your data will be everything. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what the, what like teenagers are doing anymore. Like you you can't have accurate, you know, data and insights on them. Got it. And so you said that's uh, rolling out 2023? So as of July 1st, 2023, standard universal analytics properties will stop processing data. So Google Analytics will, Google Analytics UA will stop tracking website visits, users, sessions, bounce rate. It'll stop tracking all of that. And then a little bit after that, all of your historic data is going away. But if you set up your GA4 account, even if you can't port your historic data over, it'll start tracking your, your data right now. And so okay. you can still see a comparison this year versus next year um, for some months. Yeah, and that's gonna be super valuable. So mm -hmm. if you guys haven't already, make a switch. <laughs> Yeah. And if you just are super, if you're super mad about this, like, you know, some marketers are and you want to switch off of Google Analytics, then you can also consider like Heap and Kissmetrics. There's a lot of other tools as well. But just understand that like the bread and butter, the go to analytics met metric content metric tracking tool for many marketers is going away. Yeah. As we know it. Mm -hmm. um, and then like finally, Rachel, like where if people want to connect with you, where can they find you? So I have a website at rachelandriago.com. Um, and then if you want more about those tools, I think I have it stickied somewhere. Anyway, if you go to my website, you'll see a lot of the different articles that cover some of the things that we talked about, like consumer research, audience research, tracking the value, the business value of your content, because that's always important to actually create feedback loops because right. your sales team might say, hey, why would we spend our time telling you what to write about when it doesn't contribute to our leads. So being able to track the business results and saying like, hey, this white paper sent this deal to your calendar and you closed that deal and it was this amount, that's really important to creating the, that investment team-wide. So I have articles on that. <laughs> um, and yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn. If you say in the notes, I heard you on the FlexPoint co uh, podcast, I'll, I'll add you right away. Awesome. Super excited. Uh, we obviously love being able to work with you at FlexPoint. Um, so it's been super fun. And then I really appreciate you coming on today. It's been awesome learning a little bit more about content and how to manage that. So thanks so Thank much, Rachel. So much. Yeah. Thank you for your insightful questions and your time. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, thanks again so much for tuning in to another Modern Merchant Podcast episode. If you want to learn more about us, check us out at flexpoint.com. That's flexpoint without the E.com. We've got our Modern Merchant blog up there. It's full of the latest e-commerce information and news. Also, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on socials at Flexpoint. We'll see you again next week with another episode.